Hello, everyone. It's 9 p.m. in Hong Kong, 1 p.m. in London, and 9 a.m. right here in New York City. Welcome to this live global conversation about the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. I'm honored to moderate this discussion brought to you by the University of Hong Kong. This is part of a series for all of us to learn lessons from what's happening in Hong Kong and the region. Last week, we spoke to Professor Gabriel Leung of HKU Med to learn all about the medical aspects of the crisis. Today, we're taking your questions about the economy in Asia, the US and beyond. We have the perfect guest for this topic, Professor Richard Wong, who is the provost of HKU, the highest academic officer. He's also chair of economics and the Philip Wong Kennedy Wong Professor in Political Economy. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1981. He was visiting scholar at the University of Chicago and the Hoover Institution at Stanford. He's also served on numerous bodies of numerous public bodies in Hong Kong about public housing, industry, and technology development, as well as higher education funding. His current research focuses on public housing inequality and intergenerational mobility, as well as the political economy in Hong Kong and regional economic development in China. Welcome, Professor. Well, hello, Sri. Nice to be here. Thank you for making time for this event. I have to ask you, how are you doing at this moment? We're, we're doing fine. Uh, the campus is a little bit uh, empty, except that students are studying in the learning commons and the library, and they're still living in the halls. Uh, we've, uh, the, the virus situation is, is, is firing up. The second wave has hit us. Uh, but in Hong Kong, uh, everyone wears a face mask, and I think that protects themselves and protects uh, others. Yeah, so and we're that's doing all the changes. That's one of the differences between what's happening in Hong Kong and Asia and in the US. In the US, are, most of the medical directives are for everyday people who are not sick to not wear masks. And you would be wearing, you will be wearing a mask before and after this, right? So that's the difference. Yeah, that we're we having. have been wearing masks for you know two months now. Yeah, and it's so it's also a difference in uh, you know the culture of what people are deciding is the right way to go. And it tells us we really don't know. We're both in cities that are greatly affected and we will talk about that. Folks, we're taking your questions from around the world via the hashtag HKUCOVID19. HKUCOVID19, please tweet us, please use that. And also by email, fightcovid19 at hku.hk. Fightcovid19 at hku.hk. And also follow us at HK University for the Hong Kong University Twitter handle. And I'm at Sri on Twitter, S-R-E-E. -E. Let's get right to the questions, Professor. It's been an intense week in Hong Kong and the world. Beginning today, foreign visitors and even transit passengers are barred from entering Hong Kong in any capacity. Can you tell us what's happening and what's the latest? Well, we are experiencing a second wave of the uh, virus. Um, we, the first wave came at the end of January and early February. And for almost eight weeks, uh, we only had a little bit over 100 uh, cases of confirmed infection. Uh, but in the past week, the numbers have ex escalated beyond 400. And that's primarily because a lot of people are reaching uh, Hong Kong residents are returning to Hong Kong. Travelers are coming into Hong Kong. They, they seem to have brought disease with, back to Hong Kong because the episode is now worldwide. Yeah, And that's why we are shutting our borders uh, in terms of allowing only local permanent residents to return. And that will, of but course, have an impact on the economy. And we'll talk about that in just a second, folks. If you're watching live right now, please hit share on the various platforms so that your friends and family from around the world can participate. You can also tag specific people. And if you comment in the stream you're watching, we will be able to come uh, take your question or comment and post it and show it to the world. We're live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. So please make sure you are sharing this as widely as you can. So let's talk about the economy a little bit. What is happening with the uh, economy? so far and then what will happen in hong kong now that these new rules are in place this the the news of a second wave is quite scary for those of us who are still in the first wave 
-hmm. Well, uh, the, we do not know exactly how it will develop. Uh, uh, we hope that the second wave will uh, be be uh, stopped or at least slowed down significantly, so that we wouldn't have a a massive community. Uh, outbreak, which will overwhelm our healthcare systems. Uh, because we've been going through this for more than two months now, uh, the economy is doing pretty slowly. Uh, this comes at a time when we had had a uh, uh, major, major uh, self-quarantine, uh, social distancing. This has hit retail very badly. Travelers are not coming in. So, so our, our uh, uh, export of tourist services has really come down. So, so retail, sh dining, travel, business, all this has, has hit. Um, small enterprises are, uh, are, are facing a pretty tough time. Um, many people are now um, not unemployed, but they've been asked to go home. Um, uh, without pay, so 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 the economic situation has been is is likely to to look pretty bad this year in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, thank you. I want to just read some of the comments that are coming in on Facebook. Gary is watching in Pennsylvania. He's hunkered down there. Twyla in New York says, "Thank you for this." Second wave in Hong Kong is news to me. So that just tells you, given all the headlines, that people aren't able to keep up with what's going on because so much is going on. And we also had our, our uh, we have several other comments coming in. People are sharing. So folks, please tag your friends. Please share what's happening right here. You can just share it, retweet it, or post your comments. Tell us where you are. Tell us how you're feeling right at this moment as you're thinking about the crisis around the world. Tim says CDC and New York, they're, uh, they're both worried that people are leaving the city because New York City has become an epicenter. And I know, uh, uh, Professor Wong, that you love New York. You were here just last March. You know so much about America. You've lived in America. When you're hearing this news, how do you feel about how America is reacting to all of this? Well, I think uh, uh, it's really a, a pity. It, it's, it's a rich country world-class healthcare system, but I think uh, the response has been slow and, and, and this is a very contagious disease. So, so before you know it, um, it it's escalating and, and this is pretty scary, I think. I feel very sad for what's happening to, to, uh, to, the, to many of the friends I know in, 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 in the United States. I think they are very, very anxious. Yeah, thank you. We have a question from Gary who says, what kind of COVID diagnostic kits are you using in Hong Kong? Uh, how are people doing that? Because that's a big worry here. The testing is a big question here. Well, uh, there are a variety of kits. Uh, I think a, a lot more is coming out. Uh, there are, and I'm not the technical person to, to give you advice on this. Um, you could go back to, uh, to my colleague, Gabriel Lam, who, who who's much more an expert on this. Uh, but a variety of kits are, are, are being developed. Some can give you a turnaround time uh, that is only a couple of hours. And I think that's pretty good. Good. I think um, uh, uh, the, we should develop these test kits very er massively and then streamline and triage people. Uh, the greatest danger in, the, in, in this um, virus situation is, uh, is cross-spreading, um, not only in the community, but also in the hospital. We in the U.S. have been rushing to move teaching online in the last two weeks. Uh, what is the situation with online learning, and is there anything we can learn from you that would be helpful, not just in the U.S., but countries like India? You may have seen the news that we are now, uh, the folks in India are 21 days under lockdown, and I'm thinking of my parents who are living there and so many friends and family, as I'm sure we have also lots of folks in Hong Kong with deep connections to India. Well, uh, the University of Hong Kong does not rely on online education in its normal course of activity. So we had a, uh, you know, a, a steep climb in terms of moving into uh, online education. Basically, after Chinese New Year, which is you know end of January, uh, we realized that uh, it was no longer possible to to go forward with face to face. So beginning on February, we basically moved to completely online education. We've been trying to, um, because, of, because Hong Kong wears face masks, so the spread wasn't so severe. So we're able to, 
get our final year students to come back to campus, a small number of them to finish essential laboratory work so can, we can get final year students to graduate on time without compromising on the full range of, uh, of uh, learning experiences. But, but aside from laboratories and studio work, it's all online. And many of our faculties are really putting in a lot of effort to, run, to learn quickly, uh, to master new skills that they, didn't, they don't have. And, and so far, uh, student feedback, uh, uh, which we have is uh, lectures are doing very well. And they, they find it much better than actually being in the classroom. But interaction tutorial is not as, as, as robust uh, as we hope uh, to get it. We, we probably need to fine tune to, to improve our skills in that area. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, one of the things that I think all academic institutions have to think about is what will this all look like afterwards? You know, when students are now working from home, how will they react to being back in the classroom? A lot of them will like it, but as you said, a lot of them may miss some of the online elements as well. And this is about thinking about the future of education. So let's ask you a question about small businesses. There's a lot of worry about how many will be wiped out in certain countries where this is happening. I think uh, the uh, uh, this is a time when government intervention to uh, keep small business afloat, which have been particularly hit. Um, uh, 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 government public expenditure has been increased by 20%. Our, our normal government spending is 20% of GDP. So we basically spend another uh, four to five percent of GDP uh, trying to um, uh, give every everyone in Hong Kong uh, who's an adult uh, uh, 1,300 US dollars just uh, to, to for spending to, to prop up uh, some consumption, uh, but consumption is not going to come back until you you are able to to hold the virus, to stop the virus. Because as long as the vi the, the disease is around, people don't go, out, they don't spend. So um, so this is basically you know emergency cash. In terms of companies and small business, government is basically st uh, providing. Uh, Two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars of uh, of emergency uh, low interest uh, loans to small businesses to keep to keep their businesses from collapsing. Uh, many workers in the real retail sector are are uh, are not are not working, but they are not fired. They 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 still keep their jobs, but they are not working. Thank you, Professor. We have a question from Minimi on Twitter. She says the sterling plunged last week. What would you think of the future of about the pound? And how would you think the COVID-19 will affect the ongoing Brexit trade talks and economic relations between the EU and the UK? Well, I think uh, for uh, uh, as, as soon as we are able to uh, check the outbreak and to slow down and, and eventually uh, prevent the disease from uh, escalating, uh, and accelerating, uh, then the economy will begin to come back. That's when people can go back to work, when businesses can restart. I think after that, I, I'm not worried about the pound not coming back. Now, but then the whole world is, in a, is, is now going into recession. So it will take some time before we get out of this. But, uh, uh, as, for, as for Brexit, uh, I think negotiations are, uh, uh, in terms of getting, getting an arrangement, is nobody is focusing on that. Until we get the virus situation come under control, we will not be, uh, uh, be worried about these matters. That everything is just going to be, it's like a uh, freezing of, uh, of, the, uh, of a video. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. If you're just joining us, you're in the middle of a wonderful, important discussion with Professor Richard Wong, who is the, prof is the provost or the highest academic officer at the University of Hong Kong. And he's an expert economist, and he's sharing his thoughts and taking your questions and comments about what is happening around the world as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. Please use the hashtag HKUCOVID19 so that we can see your questions. And please comment right now live on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or LinkedIn. We're on all those platforms. And we also want to share some of the comments that have been coming in. So we're just going to pull them up. We have people all over the world watching. And we're just so grateful for everyone 
listening to us and participating right now. So we're going to call up some of the comments that have come in, uh, including people watching all over the United States and in other countries. We have a question from Laura Silverman from Philadelphia. If you're ready, Professor, uh, she says, how do we stay safe at home with others? I've heard people are attempting to disinfect mail and grocery bags with spray, immediately washing clothes when they come in from the outside. What are the top things to do? Again, you're not the medical expert, but you are have lived through wave one and now wave two. So we are in America looking for all guidance. Thank you, Professor. Well, uh, I think uh, if you go out and shopping, you bring things back, doing some disinfectant, in the disinfecting is, is probably uh, 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 laudable. But the most important thing is really to, to frequently wash your hands, avoid touching your face, your eyes, and, and, and uh, your nose. You know, where, this is where the virus get into your system. So this is the key thing. You know, just keep your hands away from your face and frequently wash your hands. Washing your hands with soap uh, kills the virus. Uh, it's a very effective wash for 20 seconds uh, until it's foamy. That's the key. Um, now, it will be much better if you have a mask when you are close to people. Right? If you maintain safe distances, uh, the, the chance of spread is, 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 is reduced significantly. So that's why we talk about social distancing avoiding big crowds. If you stay at home, you, you probably don't have big crowds. Uh, and if every, anyone goes out, come back, you know, sanitize yourself, um, uh, 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 particularly your hands. Thank you. And uh, I don't think you would have ever predicted, Professor, as a professor of economics, you'd be giving hand-washing advice to people around the world that shows you what an unusual time we're in now. We have a question that is right up your academic field, a question from Alfred, who's a Master of Social Work graduate. He asks, with a commitment to nearly unlimited lending made by central banks, the cost of capital for so small and medium enterprises is very low. Do you think this monetary policy can really benefit them? Well, uh, that, uh, first of all, the reason why you have to make a confide, the Fed has to make a commitment to all this is basically there is a uh, uh, there's a liquidity crunch in the uh, financial system, particularly in the rich countries, and that is because we are in a global economy and there is a massive rush for for uh, for American uh, dollars, uh, and that's and if you don't 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 supply it, then then your the cost of capital will rise. This Oh, this prevents um, uh, caving in of small enterprises and, and a variety of other enterprises. But to get back, the, to get the economy back on feet, uh, you, you, you have to stop the virus, uh, stop the disease. Uh, until that is uh, accomplished, people will not be able to go back to work. The economy will not pick up. Transportation is not going to work uh, and, and, and uh, stores are not going to open. Uh, so, so the key to saving the economy uh, is to stop the virus. Uh, uh, flooding the system with liquidity is to prevent uh, sudden death. Thank you, that is, uh, that is helpful. Now I'm going to ask you a question uh, that I know a lot of people are thinking about. What is your advice for President Donald Trump of the United States? Well, uh, I think my advice for every president or, or uh, prime minister in the world is, uh, you know, mobilize all your resources, all the, the public resources and personnel you have to uh, spread uh, the message that people should keep safe distances until the, the disease is under control. That you must tackle the disease because you cannot uh, re-jumpstart the economy without the disease. Uh, 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 being uh, halted. And this needs to be done on a worldwide basis because uh, it's no longer a, a disease that hits only one part of the world. It, it, it is everywhere and will keep on spreading uh, despite um, uh, all the efforts to close down uh, borders. It will only slow it down, but everyone must uh, practice self-isolation and social distancing. Thank you, Professor. And folks, if you're watching right now, please hit share in the platform you're in because we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we are on YouTube and LinkedIn. Please post your comments and we will read them as well as come to you 
uh, with the questions. We will go to, we'll ask Professor Wong the questions that you're asking. We have a, a comment here. Uh, David says, Professor Wong's student from before, he would like to ask, how would the evolving co coronavirus situation affect the interaction between the US and China in the economic as well as political outcomes of the trade war? And how would the power balance change between democratic and authoritarian regimes? Well, that's uh, that's an interesting question. It's um, uh, let's let's take it, you know, in bits and pieces. I think uh, when we are when the world is fa is faced with a global virus outbreak, uh, it's absolutely important that uh, major countries begin to cooperate. First, they must cooperate by uh, fighting the disease in a coordinated manner. Uh, share share medical resources and, and expertise. I think that the, uh, animosity must abate uh, uh, in order to fight the disease. The next thing is it will, it will help the, econ the world economy if, if trade wars uh, come, uh, uh, is abated at this time, at least no further escalation. Uh, and I think that is very important because the lessons of the, uh, the Great Depression in 1929 is that when when a major economic crisis emerges, it is important for countries to cooperate. If they do not cooperate, then it will worsen the economic situation when a recession is pushed into a Great Depression. Now, so so global global cooperation in health, public health matters, as well as in coordinating uh, economic stimulation policies and. Uh, uh, and, and, and monetary and financial policies are, are very important uh, at this time to both check the virus and to uh, avoid a further worsening of what is uh, already a global recessionary situation. Now, how would the balance tip? Uh, why would we care at this point? I think, uh, you know, if you know, I, I thought a famous economist say, if you don't have, you know, in the long run, we're all dead. So I, I, I think we should uh, seize the immediate, deal with the, 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 the next few months virus problem and avoid exacerbating economic warfare. Thank you, Professor. Folks, if you're watching right now, we have another 30 minutes with Professor Richard Wong. We're taking your questions on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Please join us and please ask your questions. I'm just gonna read, Professor, some of the questions and comments that have come in from LinkedIn, just so you know and you see how global this conversation is. Carol's watching from Tampa Bay. Uh, uh, Theta is watching from Jersey City. Victoria from Miami Beach. Uh, Gail is watching from New York. Uh, we also have uh, uh, our friends watching from the south of France. And so many questions and comments coming in. Deborah says, in addition to small business, how is Hong Kong helping the self-employed? I think uh, depending in, on which sector you are in, in terms of self-employed, uh, not all parts of the economy is suffering. Uh, as, a, as an international financial center, uh, uh, which has moved on onto cyberspace a long time ago, uh, is fundamentally un, unaffected. Banks are, of course, aff affected because uh, economic activity, real economic in activity in, in the, uh, is, is slowing down. Uh, in terms of the self-employed, if you are self-employed in the IT sector, uh, things are not doing badly at all. Uh, there's a huge demand for, for uh, online services uh, uh, or services that can be delivered through some online platform. Uh, However, if, uh, in Hong Kong, if you're a taxi driver, most of them are self-employed. Uh, if you were in, in, in all these personal services, uh, most of them are self-employed. Well, the economy me, has, is, is already in recession. Last year, we had a minus 1.2% growth rate. Uh, this year, is, it is going to look a lot worse. Uh, so I think self-employment for personal services a variety of service sector is not doing well. Now, uh, that's why Hong Kong government has been uh, handing out cash, you know, 1300 uh, US dollars per person, per adult uh, to all residents. Uh, this is to tie them over through a difficult period of time. Uh, fundamentally, there is Hong Kong's economy is totally 
uh, link up with the world. It cannot rejump itself uh, without the whole world recovering. Yeah, let's just, uh, a question that came in from Joanne Chan, she says, how should a lower price ceiling be implemented considering that many people are unable to buy enough masks at a low price? Are there any other measures adopted or should be adopted by the Hong Kong government? And then we're gonna go really big. We're gonna ask a question about Boeing. Uh, if you think of it the other way, I don't think uh, if, 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 if to set a price uh, ceiling on, on mass is not the solution. In fact, if you uh, mask had, prices have increased by five times to ten times uh, during that during the past two months. But what is um, what is fascinating is that the market works. When you when you pay higher prices, you can find masks. Masks are available on sale in many stores, in numerous stores now. Uh, at the beginning, there was there were long queues. Now you don't have queues. Uh, but prices are high. But prices are high everywhere in the world. Basically, there's a huge shortage of, of, of uh, masks at the moment. 50% of the masks, face masks that were produced, were produced uh, in China. Uh, and China started stop exporting, and, the, and therefore there's a shortage. Now, uh, getting enough face masks uh, requires actually uh, to let the free market uh, mobilize the resources to make it work. I think it is it will come down. The prices will come Thank down. Thank you. Thank you. Our, let's talk about big corporations. We've talked about the self-employed. We've talked about businesses, media-sized businesses, big corporations. Boeing, as an example, are asking for bailouts from the U.S. government. Do you think government should provide bailouts to corporations in the current crisis? And what are the oversight requirements so that they don't just do stock buybacks and instead help workers and really help the economy? Um, well, um, bailouts is a complicated question. Uh, I think the most important issue is how to, uh, is to, to protect as many smaller and medium-sized enterprises because that's where um, the, 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 hot, the, the main core of economic activity uh, uh, lies in every economy and where most of the people are, are employed. So I would certainly favor uh, preference be given over to small, medium enterprises in terms of uh, supporting a recovery of the economy. Uh, for the larger corporations, most of them, most of them actually uh, are not in dire straits. Now, you mentioned specifically Boeing. Boeing was not doing well because they 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 had produced produced uh, 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 a new new new, new uh, plane that that had had flaws in it, and so they, they were already in a difficult economic uh, uh, situation before the the the, uh, the the coronavirus hit. Now, it's I mean, that. Saving Boeing is, is a completely different matter. Uh, it, it may be a strategic national asset to save it, but then all, all airlines uh, uh, are in dire straits now. Thank you. I'm just reading from some questions and comments that are on LinkedIn. Goran says hello from Croatia. He's a doctor in Croatia, is watching right now on LinkedIn. We have uh, Mr. Reddy watching from India. And Amilda asks, the professor said the second wave was caused primarily by residents' returns or foreigners coming? Was it because they were not quarantined by the state? Are second waves possible otherwise? When is China expected to resume production? So the well, China is, trying, China is already trying to re resume economic production. Now, the best estimates probably show that in the past two months, China's economic activity had declined by perhaps as much as 20% in the last uh, two months. Uh, that's a very serious decline. Now they're trying to come pick it up. Uh, but picking it up is uh, the supply chains are beginning to move. But then because the whole world um, is, uh, is now uh, having going into a global economic recession, the buying power um, uh, has also reduced. So, so re recovery in China also, economic recovery in China also depends on the whole world uh, checking the virus uh, spread. On, on, the, on, the, on the matter of um, uh, the second wave, because Hong Kong is a, is a small open city. We have done very well because people have been wearing face masks and self-protecting. 
Uh, however, as the disease began to spread to the whole world, Hong Kong has a very globalized population, people who live uh, 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 and work outside Hong Kong, uh, students who study abroad. And because the virus situation worsened uh, in, in North America, in, in, in Europe, then many of them returned to Hong Kong. Now they are residents. Now, some of them are travelers, but most of them are residents and they've brought the disease back to Hong Kong. Uh, so that's why we are beginning to exercise that even for local residents. Uh, anyone who come back, they have to go into quarantine for 14 days. Thank you, Professor. Abby in Boston has a question about the stock market in Hong Kong. Has it reacted like in the US? And then we have a question also about the uh, housing market and real estate market in Hong Kong. So if you can talk about both of those, please. OK. Well, the stock market has, well, Hong, as an international financial center, all markets are connected. Uh, so Hong Kong's markets has, has come down like elsewhere. Uh, but has come down less so because most of the stocks that are listed on our stock market are primarily Asian stocks and, and stocks whose primary economic activity has been in China. Now, China's virus situation has been uh, pretty much abated at the moment. Uh, and as a result, uh, the, the outlook is less uncertain compared to the economic outlook in, in North America and in, and in Europe. And that's why in the, in the, in the past uh, two weeks or so, uh, the, the Hong Kong stock market has come down much less than, uh, say, those in Europe and in North America. Um, so now in terms of, of uh, property markets, um, Hong Kong's property markets have been very high to a large extent because of the shortage of uh, housing stock and, and the slow rate of housing supply as well as uh, commercial uh, uh, property. With the economic slowdown, it's, it's unavoidable that uh, the property market will uh, decline. Economic activity is slowing down. So commercial rents, retail rents are all coming down. Property prices are coming down. Uh, but I think, I think uh, because of the continual shortage of uh, the housing stock as well as the commercial uh, uh, real estate, I think the correction will be uh, 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 will, will not be like um, uh, like it was in say twenty years ago uh, when the Asian financial crisis, when the property market correct, corrected by more than fifty percent. Thank you, Professor. I just want to show you Tuesday and Wednesday's Wall Street Journal headlines so we can discuss them. Tuesday, the headline was stock slide as lawmakers tussle. You know that what was happening here. And this morning, it's, as you know, it's morning in New York. It's nighttime in Hong Kong. This is the yeah. headline. Dow soars 11% best day in 87 years. So uh, what do you think? And uh, will this last? What is what is going to happen? I know it's hard to predict, of course, but you know the U.S. stock market well. Please talk about that. Well, it's a volatile uh, uh, tillity would probably be the characteristics of all stock markets going forward for, for quite a bit of time. Uh, I would not predict what will happen tomorrow or what will happen in the next week. I think fundamentally, once we get the virus situation uh, spread under control, and then the economy will gradually uh, recover. If we, if governments are are uh, are able to to cooperate, and we avoid uh, aggravating the global uh, trade uh, tensions, uh, then we will probably be able to recover much faster. I think uh, it is learning the lessons of history uh, in a global. Uh, economic crisis, this time uh, sparked by a, a, an outbreak of a highly contagious and infectious disease. Uh, it is all the more important for uh, countries to cooperate uh, in this area. Uh, if we don't, I think uh, we'll be looking at a rather bleak economic prospect. Uh, it will have constant. Now, in the, in the, if you go, go three years, four years, we, I'm pretty confident that we pr will probably get a handle over the, 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 the viral situation. We'll be able to manage the disease much better. 
uh, I, I would think at that time, uh, people will rethink the shape of globalization. Global supply chains will not disappear. Certain, certain information and communication technology-driven economic activity will probably grow even more robust. But global supply chains might become more diversified. Uh, and this could actually be a good news for many developing countries that had missed out on the uh, globalization driven by information and communications technology uh, in the last 30 years. Uh, so, so, so not everything necessarily is bleak. Um, I think global supply chains are here to say, but they stay, but they might be reconfigured. They'll give greater diversity uh, to, uh, to in terms of regional spread. And, and uh, uh, so, so not everything is, is uh, bad news. I un uh, understood uh, folks who are watching right now. I'm learning a lot. I know you're learning a lot. So let's share this conversation on Facebook, on Twitter. Just hit share or tag specific friends or retweet. And please follow at HKUniversity. And also, we're using the hashtag HKUCOVID19. Please ask your questions in the streams you're in right now if you're watching live. And of course, please retweet and please share. We are doing the series of conversations so that we can learn from our friends in Hong Kong and from the experts at Hong Kong University. We're getting so many questions and comments coming in, Professor. So we're going to speed it up a little bit, if that's OK, so that we can really get everybody in. And we should also point out it's uh, 9.40 PM in Hong Kong right now. You've already had a long day. You're doing so great. So thank you. Jennifer Chan asks, what do you think are the most resilient industries that will come out of this global recession and market climate, and why? Thank you. Well, I think, uh, I think uh, the, the modern uh, uh, information, communications, technology uh, sectors will, will certainly do well. I think uh, this might be an opportunity for us to rethink uh, our investment in healthcare. Uh, uh, in, uh, so that we probably should put a lot more effort into um, uh, uh, infectious disease uh, treatment, uh, uh, the, the, the research into uh, 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 antibiotics, viral drugs, and I think uh, healthcare, care, uh, public health care pr uh, protection to, to mitigate uh, such a, you see, with a more globalized world, uh, it opens up also the opportunity for diseases to spread. So I would think healthcare and information communications technology uh, sectors are going to do well. That's that's great to that's great to know. We have more questions coming in, and one of them is about China. It's begun to reopen and to restart the economy. Do you see a quick recovery? And what is your estimate of China in terms of growth going forward? Well, I think they will recover, but I do not think it will be a recovery that will bring them back to their old trajectory, largely because we are still in a global uh, uh, recessionary environment. So we, we have to solve the global problem in order to solve also China's problem, which, which is a fairly open economy, has, has, uh, is an important part of the global supply chain. Uh, the other thing is whether China can uh, readjust its economy uh, in a di re global recessionary environment towards more domestic consumption uh, so that it becomes more internal demand driven and less global demand driven. That means the recovery will also be a, 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 at a rate that will be slower than what we have seen in, the, in this his recent historical past, which, which is very much like uh, 6 to 8% growth rates. Uh, if it's going to rely primarily on domestic driven uh, 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 consumption power, um, then I think its growth, its recovery will not be as robust as, uh, as we've seen in the past. Thank you. Amy Howe is watching from New York City. Gary says, very sound advice from, uh, uh, from Professor Wong. Arlene is watching from New York. Uh, can we just reflect for a minute? You know, we're talking so much about the news and everything. Talk about the relationship between Hong Kong and the United States and reflect a little bit on your own time and friendships here in the US, please, Professor. Um, well, uh, you know, uh, things have been going so fast uh, that uh, we don't uh, take the time to stop. Uh, 
we talk about the face mask thing. Um, I noticed that on many universities, um, as a result of the outbreak, basically students are all going home and they are and relying entirely on online education uh, for for learning. Um, this creates a lot of stresses uh, that um, uh, in terms of an adjustment process. Here at the University of Hong Kong, uh, we have moved on to that mode, but a, a lot of students are still on campus. Uh, and uh, some of them, them have continued to stay in the dormitory. Dormitories are pretty, pretty full. Uh, and students are back in the libraries. They are studying. Uh, although there are no classes, but they are studying. Uh, they can have access to all types of resources. And what I'm saying is there are different strategies to react to a crisis situation. Uh, um, and I think uh, what has taught me is that as, as a university professor, uh, we are very much bound by the kind of culture uh, we, we are adjusted to. In Hong Kong, uh, because we had a uh, SARS outbreak 17 years ago, the population is, uh, once we know an infectious disease coming, everyone puts on face masks, right? The market brings their masks at a highly escalated prices, but people would, would be willing to pay for it. And then there is still uh, activity that can be maintained. Right? And I think this is important. And I think as I look at the thing back at the United States, I think, I think there are many things that we can learn from each other in this crisis. Uh, I think the, the, the United States has been, the universities have been able to, to respond very quickly, I think, uh, in the face of a massive outbreak to get students to go back home. I think that, that's, a, that's a really good, uh, fast and immediate response. Uh, at, uh, for uh, but but uh, if we if if we could if we were to go through this again, I think you know they could could take a look at how how we have in Hong Kong have been adapting to it in in, in a somewhat different way, way so with 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 less draconian measures. If we take it early and we we go on to a a a much more prepared, vigilant situation of keep, keeping social distances. Thank you, Professor. We have a question from Facebook. What, if any, will be the long-term consequences of quantitative easing? Do you expect inflation to spike as a result of the uh, massive printing of money, or will it be offset by higher unemployment and a positive supply driven by lower oil prices? And this is a question that has come from Yar. Thank you very much, Yar. And please, folks, please keep posting your questions and please share and retweet the conversation happening right now with Professor Richard Wong, who's the provost, the highest academic officer at the University of Hong Kong. Well, um, quantitative easing, um, first initiated uh, in the, by the US Fed, has been ongoing for pretty much a whole decade. There were a lot of concerns that it will will ignite inflation in the in the early years, you know, 2010, 2011, uh, but that has not materialized. Uh, it remains a bit of a anomaly. Why quantitative easing did not increase uh, inflation? Well, it doesn't for a variety of reasons, uh, but fundamentally, uh, there is no compelling evidence that quantitative easing will ignite inflation. Uh, it does it, uh, result in massive as asset price appreciation, uh, but it did not seem to have stimulated uh, a lot of rapid economic growth, uh, although uh, you know the, the record varies from country to country. So I'm not too worried about it reigniting inflation at all. Okay, thank you. So this has been like a master class with Professor Wong, who's a great economist. And you don't have to just be satisfied with this conversation. And you don't have to be yet a student at the University of Hong Kong to benefit from his knowledge because he has done a MOOC, a massive open online course. And Professor, with your permission, we're going to show a little trailer from, uh, from that. And I will ask you, after we watch a little bit of it, I'll, I'll come in with you know, you can just narrate what what is what it's like, why the course is important, et cetera. You can talk about that uh, when I come to you in a minute. So uh, here is the video.
This is the first of four courses in a sequence that applies economic analysis to the study of the state, the law, and the economy. We explore the rationale for having the state, the law, from an economic framework. The critical difference between democracies and autocracies as alternative political systems. We examine how state and legal institutions can affect economic development and how economic development can affect political change or political... Professor, I want to take that class. Uh, tell us about this and how did that come about? Anyone can sign up for it right now using uh, going to edX, uh, can find it. We'll also put the, you know, the, the URL so that everyone can see it. But if you go to edX, you can search it up and just put in Professor Wong's name, Richard Wong, State Law and the Economy. So talk about this course, please. Well, this is a course I've been um, uh, giving at the university for, you know, uh, 30 years. And um, the, the key of this course is basically to apply economic tools to help us understand how uh, different political systems, different legal systems can impact uh, economic development, can impact economic growth, and how decisions are made, and whether uh, it, whether, and, and even particularly under democracies and in contrast to autocracies, and within democracies, uh, there is a liberal trend, uh, which tries to limit the size of government, to give more freedom to, to individuals to, to lead their own lives versus populist democracies, uh, which try to be uh, uh, appeasement of the crowds, uh, vote gathering, and, and does not necessarily respect the uh, freedoms and liberties of individuals. Um, and, and we like to, to contrast these different types of, of uh, political systems and how they affect uh, economic as well as uh, political decision making uh, in different societies. So, so we do a comparative analysis of different countries uh, in different periods of history. You know, 100, 200 students, you're teaching it to thousands of students. Uh, are you ready for that? Well, yeah, I'll, uh, it, I'll see how it happens. Uh, I look forward to getting a response from students. I will take my course. Uh, I, sometimes their questions have been important in, in stimulating uh, my uh, thinking and also how I uh, uh, continue to develop the, the contents of the course. And sometimes students ask very tough questions and uh, that get me thinking. Yeah, no, thank you. And on the screen, we have the sign up for the MOOC, the Massive Open Online Course, State Law and the Economy. And people can go right onto the edX site and find it. Otherwise, please go to the very important Hong Kong U website all about fighting COVID-19 so that you can see previous sessions of this conversations that we have in the series, as well as you can learn from uh, how to learn about all the different things that the university is doing. That's called fightcovid19.hku.hk. Very important. We only have a few minutes left. And Steve says the session with uh, my guest has become an important part of the daily life. Uh, talk a little bit, Professor, about the role of these. You know, we talk about social distancing, but we're more connected than ever now. We're physically distant, but more connected. As you can see behind me, we've got the Hudson River. So I'm taking you to New York, and I'm now with you at the campus of Hong Kong University. Talk a little bit about that, please. Well, I think uh, um, what, the, what the, the virus situation has occurred is that as we begin to become uh, more distant from, um, uh, from each other physically, Men being a social animal uh, just craves to be to reach out to be connected, and it's really great today that we have this information communications technology breakthrough that allow us to be connected in different ways, strangers uh, as well as friends. Uh, you've never felt so close to people, and uh, sometimes you watch video clips of people struggling at this time and you really feel bad the 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 the, the videos they come from italy from some of them are 
people who I've known in the past and the stories they tell, they make me cry. And, and then on better days, uh, we are connected to friends all over the world uh, and we share in their happiness and in their lives as they get, as well, at my age, as they have grandchildren. And I think that's, that's a great uh, uh, thing to have happened. Uh, we could be stay connected in ways that I could have never have imagined when I was a student. And we just, we're talking today, just as the news of Prince Charles being diagnosed with the virus tells you that no one is immune from this. No one is safe. Any economic strata, any, no matter how famous or how successful, everybody can be exposed to this and can uh, have health problems. We have a question from Priscilla Wong. Uh, she says, Professor Wong, how quickly do you think the Hong Kong economy, other Asian economies, and economies in the rest of the world can recover from this hit? I know it's hard to predict. So if you can walk us through, and I presume you have different scenarios, best case, worst case for different regions, correct? Well, the best case scenario is that everyone becomes um, very vigilant uh, uh, to, uh, to check the disease, that governments cooperate with each other to make uh, the spread of the disease enemy number one, then it is not impossible that by, by late uh, latter part of this year, the disease would slow down. We could go back to, to some normal economic life. Uh, and pretty much towards the end of this year, we may be able to see a turnaround. Uh, and and that's the best case scenario. Uh, and then the recession would last, you know, maybe one year, uh, and then we'll be out of it. Uh, there are um, worst case scenarios uh, that would in, involve governments not willing to be cooperative, governments not sufficiently vigilant in checking the disease in some parts of the world, uh, or or adopting not as effective policies in checking um, uh, the disease, um, this will, these would all slow down the recovery. That means um, it, it may take us beyond the current calendar year. So that's worrisome for a lot of people as we listen to that. Um, uh, thank you, Professor. We're just going to read some of these comments as we, there's so many people posting questions and comments, and we're just so grateful for everyone's attention. We want to remind you that we have a terrific website from the Hong Kong uh, University HKU that you can find fightcovid19.hku.hk, and you can also send in your questions to uh, the website. You can also tweet at HK University. You can also please follow at HK University on Twitter. We are going to continue this series so that we can learn uh, everything possible from Hong Kong and the region. Before we go, Professor, anything you'd like to share about Hong Kong University, uh, the resilience of its students, the faculty that you would like to share with the world uh, right now? Well, um Actually, in Hong, at Hong Kong University, I'm actually very amazed at the resilience of the, um, both the students, the staff, and the teachers. Uh, when, when the virus broke out, uh, nobody was well prepared. Nobody knew exactly how it would turn out. Uh, it was incredible that people became very quickly unified, uh, both in terms of uh, the way they decided how we will tackle this, we went very quickly to go onto online education to keep the campus on a low density population. Uh, everybody practiced vigilance in terms of uh, social distancing, self self hygiene, and making a lot of sacrifices uh, in order to keep the university functioning. They were uh, um, and and I think uh, I'm I. You know, going through this th these few months as um, and seeing how people have pitched in uh, ha has been really one of the most moving and touching things that have happened uh, uh, in Hong Kong. And I'm 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 really uh, delighted to have be have the opportunity to to uh, to be able to uh, work with all my colleagues and students to 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 share their 
their challenge, their their uh, their mood mood swings, and and then their willingness to soldier on. I think that's that's a very comforting thought, uh, and I hope uh, people in other parts of the world that are that are still going through the most difficult part of the time um, to take confidence that um, uh, that this 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 will end. Uh, if we put in enough effort and we uh, coordinate uh, and uh, our efforts and 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 for once um, I think about uh, a broader commitment uh, to humanity and to the safety of all others. Thank you. What a beautiful thought to end on. You have given me hope. You've given me knowledge, and we are so grateful. Our guest has been Professor Richard Wong, who is the provost of the University of Hong Kong, the highest academic officer, is also the chair of economics and the Philip Wong Kennedy Wong Professor in Political Economy. Thank you very much, Professor. We wish you and your colleagues the very best. This is a part of a series for all of us to learn from lessons of what's happening in Hong Kong and beyond. Last week, we spoke to Professor Gabriel Leung of HKU Med on the medical aspects. Today's conversation was all about the economic aspects, and we had a comment here. I'm just going to read a couple of these. Fiona Lee says, thank you, Professor. Uh, looking forward to learning more from you. We had a comment saying, can we do part two of this chat? Uh, Sunny says, can we do part two? Probably not so late and not at this time with the professor, but if he's willing, we would love to have him back. Uh, thank you so much, says Jason. And he shows a strong emoji because I think we all need to be strong. And you have given us great ideas on how to stay that. Lan says, thank you so much, Professor Wong, for doing this. Laura says, very helpful conversation, insights about many aspects of this shared experience. Wonderful to end on a hopeful note. So let us end there. Thank you all for watching. Please follow at HK University on Twitter. My name is Sri Srinivasan. I'm a professor at Stony Brook School of Journalism. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to moderate the conversation. Please tweet at me, at Sri, S-R-E-E, -E. My email is sri at sri.net. Thank you very much, Professor, and we'll say goodbye. And we'll have you, you win. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, peace and safe, uh, in safety in New York. Thank you. You too.